Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Exploring Early Childhood Assistive Technology at Home. Um, what we're going to go over today is going to be an array of different assistive technology that you can extend into the home setting. Um, and so we're going to get started. Okay. So when we hear assistive technology, most of us think of apps, computer programs, and devices. But what is assistive technology? Assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, software program, or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of persons with disabilities through IDA 2004. Um, so having said this, um, we in the preschool setting use a lot of low-tech visual aids. Um, and we use, as, we use them as adults in, in our environmental, pr environmental print as when we come to understand the world around us. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do a little testing your IQ. And you guys are welcome to just shout out the answers. And we're going to look at some visuals and see what you think they are. So we're testing our IQ. What does that sign mean? Right. <laughs> McDonald's. And this one bathroom. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> good. Very good. That's another one of my favorites. <laughs> An emoji, right. Does anyone? What's <laughs> laughing? Right, lol. <laughs> right. So even as adults, we are using visuals to be able to navigate and understand the world around us. If we were in a foreign country or if we were somewhere else, like these visuals, if we saw them, we would know, okay, if I want coffee, I could go to Starbucks. So we also need to provide those opportunities for our students in the early childhood setting, especially because it's most likely their first school experience and we want to prepare them for what they're going to have when they go into the school age setting. So. Why do we use visuals? We use visuals to clarify verbal information, encourage child initiation, and help maintain attention. Um, so like I said, visuals are embedded in our early childhood programs. Um, they are used to help students learn routines, for them to be able to follow directions, learn the rules, develop language development, um, understand their environment, new concepts, learn socially appropriate behaviors, self-care skills, um, and so forth. So what we're going to go over today is ways of how to integrate a lot of low-tech visuals in the home setting. So when do I use visuals? So our students thrive off of routines and um, structure. And one of the things that you will commonly see in early childhood classrooms is a visual schedule of what the expectations are for the day. Well, learning doesn't just stop in the educational setting. Like, we also need to be able to extend it to the home setting. So it allows that predictability. If there's any, if, if, there, if there is ever a change in the routine, the child already knows what to expect because this can be changed throughout the day. And some of our students, they have difficulties with transitions and change. So this is a great tool to use to be able to support knowing what to expect. Um, and as a part of uh, our workshop, we are doing some make and takes. Um, and the one that we're going to be doing is the one right here um, to the right where it says done. And it, it's really just a foldable. But the materials that we're providing, really, we want everyone to be able to have access to it. It's not things that need to be bought or special materials. Like this is paper that literally it's a foldable. And these can be interchanged depending on whatever the schedule is for the day. Um, the ones that I have for the picture symbols, I tried to integrate as much of the schedule or routine that you would do in a home setting. So for example, like whether it's going to the grocery store, going to the mall, 
um, going to a party and so forth. So we'll do that a little bit later, but this is a great tool that I use and I think it allows children to visually see, okay, what do we have to do today? So this one has, okay, we have to get dressed. Okay, let's get, get dressed. After that, you, the child can flip it over. So it also gives them the ability to participate in the routine as well that they can say, okay, we're done, we're done. And it gives them that extra reinforcement. Um, another thing is being able to break down tasks. So a lot of this comes very automatic for us. But when we think about children with delays, steps and following um, directions can be difficult for them. So providing a visual in front of the sink to be able to find the steps, to be able to follow hand washing routines. I put one here for getting dressed um, in the morning. The one that I have for us is washing hands and brushing teeth. Um, and again, like you can put it in front of the sink when the student, uh, when the child is getting ready for bed or in the morning, they know the steps. And this fosters a lot of independence because we want parents to be able to let their children practice that autonomy, autonomy and be able to grow and be as self-sufficient as possible. These are also things that are in the early childhood program that we want to be able to foster as much as independence as possible because it's not just one child that we're worrying about. We've got a classroom, so as much as they can do on their own, we want to be able to support that as much as possible. So breaking down tasks is another great way to use visuals. Um, okay, when else can we use visuals? So choice boards. Um, this one specifically has to do with making choices in food items. But a lot of times you'll see when we have centers in the classroom, not every center is open. They are given a choice of what is open and a lot of times you'll see covers over the other shelves that are not open and that's, those are indications of, okay, we have these choices and when you allow children to make choices, it, a little, it uh, reduces the resistance that they have. Also the overstimulation of being able to have access to everything at all at once and being able to master appropriate play skills. So using choice boards, whether it's for meal times, center choices, um, play choices, or even if it's a favorite app or a movie, um, giving them the opportunity to say, okay, this is what we have available. What choice are you gonna make based on that? And a lot of the things that we're using here are from BoardMaker, but a lot of times we encourage parents to take pictures of their actual child maybe doing something or of the, the actual items that they're using and printing them out because then it makes it more meaningful. Um, and they also feel like they're part of the process as well. So, okay, so again, behavior. <laughs> This is a big one. And this is one that you will constantly see a lot of visual supports, whether it's for a token board, first then. Um, so this is also one of the things that you'll take away. And it's, it's super simple. First we do this, then we do this. And I also like to use a timer when I use these. Um, so they know, okay, for five minutes, this is the activity we're gonna do, and then we're gonna move on. This one just has food choices, so let's say like celery sticks are less, you know, desirable. But then you get Cheerios. So we can try this first, and then we get that next. Um, but this is also just for them to know what they need to do in order to get something. And with this, we also have, sorry, a token board system, which Malia made, they're super cute. Um, 
so these ones, these are the tokens down here. Um, and she just based them on different um, characters that are appealing to little kids. So this one is a Mickey Mouse one, and I think you have a princess one and a Cars one. But, but again, once the student or the child is able to perform the direction that was asked, so, okay, I want you to clean up. Can you show me you can clean up? So they would get a token for each time they perform that activity. Sometimes the tokens are reinforcing enough. Other times it might need to be a, a, um, a more tangible reward afterwards, whether it's like iPad time or they get like M&Ms or something. But um, token boards, you will see this used throughout like elementary, middle school, high school, um, it's a great tool to use to learn how to um, follow directions and display appropriate behaviors. And lastly, um, we have visuals for social supports and social stories. Um, do any of you guys use social stories by any chance? No. Okay. So the great thing about social stories is that it uses simplified language um, and it really breaks down for students to know, okay, it's okay to feel a certain way. However, this is the appropriate way to handle that. So we're teaching coping strategies, calming strategies, and really just a lot of social appropriate so it's really appropriate skills for them to be able to function in um, their environment. So the one that we have particularly up here is when I'm frustrated. That's a common one that especially our preschoolers have is they are still learning a lot of self-regulation. They don't know, okay, if I, if I have a tantrum, is that gonna get attention? What do I get out of that? Well, that's great, however, that's not how we would ask or get something that we want. So this is a way of teaching them what are other alternatives that we can use instead of having a tantrum, instead of crying, instead of yelling, instead of hitting, what are ways that we can work through that? So this is another make and take that we'll do. Um, this social story is also, they, the child can color it um, as you go and read the story with them. And then this here is a pinwheel, so it's two-sided, and it comes up with different strategies that the child can choose of ways to calm down. So for example, um, they can spin it and say, I want to listen to music, or I want to read a book. Um, and there's just different ways for them to be able to express um, their emotions appropriately. Yes. You can start this very young. Like, I've used social stories with two-year-olds in my classroom. Um, they've been able. It's it's a lot of repetition that you'll see in the language used, and it's very simple language. And again, it has the visuals to support and modeling. So yes, no problem. Sorry, I forgot. I was supposed to repeat that question. Um, the question was, um, what age can you start using social stories? And my response was, you could start using them as early, I mean, even before two. Like, just like you would read a story to infants, the more the repetition, the more understanding they have. Um, these are also used for, like, you'll see toileting a lot. Um, You'll see, what are some other examples of social stories that they've had with behaviors? Um, yes, that's another one. Like, if they're starting to go to school, starting something new, or if it's something that they're anxious about, um, being able to do that in a social story. And also, this one is free, but again, Having pictures of them actually doing things and having that as a social story is a good way to make it meaningful and for them to make that connection between the two. So, any questions about visual aids so far? 
Yes. And right. And have the time to create all of it. I try it. I did some, but I still want to find other resources. Yes, so there are other resources, but they are still paid programs, not as expensive okay. as board. board Maker, but another one that we commonly, you know, suggest for people is Lesson Picks. Lesson it's L-E-S-S-O-N-P-I-X. -S okay. um, and those have some other tools. Do you guys have any other ones that? You can also just search in Google Images, and you can search for Board Maker Pictures, and you can save those, and you'll oh, often find Right. Oh. Like on a specific topic. Like if you search a specific topic, yeah. for example, if it was toileting, you could yeah. say toileting steps or like toileting social story. And then you'll see a bunch of resources. It's that social story more than more, uh, car, because you need another piece of things to make a story and show it to right. the, the kid. And so, you know, the toileting is a little bit easier because I take pictures of her. But yes. when you want to do a little more, uh, then you need. Yes, I understand. Yes, so um, I don't know if your child is in any program right now, uh, special ed program. She's not in special ed, but she's not. She was. Yeah. Okay, but collaboration with the teacher, finding what resources they have as well, would also be okay. a good tool. Okay. Yes, your question. Yes. There's a lot of teachers that just have done these and you pay a small fee and you can print it out on the computer. And then I think on Pinterest you can also find yes. a lot of people doing it too. Yes. That's very true. Like a lot of teachers I know, I, I mean when I was a teacher, I, my two favorite sites were Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers because I didn't have to reinvent the wheel a lot of times. Things are... It's time consuming. It's hard. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, we're gonna start making some materials. All right, so the first one um, we'll do is, we'll do the schedule. Um, if you guys could help me pass out some stuff. So they need to get one of that and one of these. So you'll see baggies um, in the middle of the table. You'll just need one, and that's the small materials that you'll need. And I can help pass that out, so. Are you sure? Okay. I'll get you guys some scissors here. You're welcome. Are you making one too? All right. There you go. What's that? Is everything passed out? Yes. So the things that you'll need for, oh, can I get one of these ones? The things that you'll need for this one are um, the Velcro strips and your scissors. So you're only gonna cut one side of your um, paper. So if you can just cut along the black component. Yeah. So you won't cut in the middle. No, not the middle. So if it's facing this way, you're gonna cut down here. If it's a uh, landscape, you just cut one side this and then you'll fold your pieces
And again, you can choose whatever you want to write, or you don't have to write anything at all because this can use this, this can be used this way or this way, um, and it could be used for schedule or task analysis. So you don't have to necessarily write anything on it. But if that you feel your child would benefit from seeing like done or a happy face sticker or something, you can add that on the front. And then once you've folded it, so you want to fold it, yeah, that way. So you'll have the black lines in the middle instead of the outside. And then when you guys done that part, just raise your hand so I can know where everyone's at. Are we good back there? Okay, perfect. So the Velcro that um, you're gonna use as your backing is the soft Velcro. Um, and you're gonna put them one in the middle of each square. Okay, you put one in the middle of each square. And then you'll also need one at the bottom of each square, because that will be where it closes. Yeah. Yeah. So some of them have the dot ones and some of them have rectangular ones, but you guys should all have the soft Velcro. Oh yeah. So here, these are, yes. That's, yeah, that's soft Velcro. Did everyone find their soft Velcro? Okay. And then the last part is you're going to now find your hard Velcro and we're going to put that on the opposite side at the top. Um, what actually, before you do that, what I like to do is I like to put it on the soft Velcro and then close it. So that way it has the proper alignment. So if you put it facing as if you were going to put it on and then close it over. Are you feeling a bit softer? Yeah, because I'm are sorry. Yeah, yeah those, those are soft. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. These are soft. I don't yep. have a hard for the top. Oh, these are hard. Yeah, I, you want to use a. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, where are we in terms of time? So the rest of the Velcro that you'll find in your bag is for these picture symbols. Um, you can, if you're finished, you could do it now. I wouldn't, we're, we didn't allot for time to cut it for right now um, because we have other things that I wanna make with you, but um, just know that the rest of the hard Velcro that's in your bag is for these picture symbols. Do you have your hard Velcro? Okay. Okay, perfect. 
Okay. Okay. What? Can you wake up your computer? Oh, yes. laminate with a sharpie and it, it works yes like yes um, so if you're gonna write on this um, just use a sharpie um, or you could do stickers whichever one um, and then just raise your hand when you've done um, the actual foldable part and then we'll move on to the next one all right perfect Okay, so we'll put that one aside, and then, ooh, which one should I do next? This one. This one. The next thing we'll do is the um, coping strategies wheel. So you'll get one of each, and the things that you're going to look in your baggie for are two of the tacks and then two paper clips. Actually, we could probably get another one, two, three, four, glue. You've got glue. And you'll also need your glue. Absolutely. I think we have we have a ton. Okay. Yes. Yes. They have the same. Okay. I'll, I'll, we'll switch out one of. I might have probably. I thought they were in the projectile, sorry. No, I probably did, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Does anyone else have the same? Okay, so great, I'm glad. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna cut out both circles. You have two? Uh, I was gonna okay. do the same. Okay. You and have to, can I get one of each as well? Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. That way. Can so I can just demonstrate. Once you have your wheels cut out, just raise your hand so I can see. I'm just wondering why you have to cut it out and have it back to back. Is there a reason for that? Um, instead of having individually? Yeah. Just for, um, I would say it's for space. Like, I would want to have it all together instead of having to carry two different things with me. So her question was, why do I have it back to back? You can choose how you want it. I purposely made it to have it back to back so that way I can carry this with me wherever I go and I'm not having to carry two different things and they can have the choices on both sides. So it just depends on what you prefer, but if you, if you want to have them separate, you're more than welcome to keep them separate. Yeah. Okay, so then what you're going to do from this point is you're going to get your tack and your, so we're going to do each one individually and then we'll glue them together. So if you put your tack into one part of 
it's the smaller end of the paper clip. And then you're just going to poke a hole through the middle of the paper. And the small. Just like that? Yep. Yeah. Just like that. And then a couple of these parts. And then put, yeah, use the, the tack to push a hole in the middle. And then expand it on the back. Yeah, and the small part. There's a skinnier part. Um, n no, the end. Yeah. So you're going to do that with both of them. I don't even know where my other one is. Does anyone need any help? And so what I did to make the paper clip more visible, um, I didn't put it in your baggies, but you're welcome to take whatever you need from what we have here is I just took shiny tape and I wrapped it around the paper clip so that way it acts as the pointer. So I didn't put it in your bag, but you're welcome to use some and cut. We don't have enough, but we can pass them around. Is this to spin or is it for them to choose? For them to choose. I mean, I overdid it, you think? No, no, no. You see, it doesn't spin well, so, or, or it's for them to move it like this with their hand. Right. Ah. Yes. Okay. I mean, if you, you could use it as a game if you think no, that. No, no. <laughs> because we use it for game spinners. So right. Will tend right. To, to, I think to it's, the yeah, it's yeah. just for them to point to which one ah, they want to use as a combing strategy. Okay. I mean, you can even practice this with all of your, like, each strategy with your child so they know what it looks like. Yeah. You're um, Shiny yes, I think we have. So then once you've put both of them on, this is the part where you're going to glue them together. And this is, again, up to you if you decide to glue them together or not. Um, that's your choice. <laughs> So just make sure that you don't put glue on the actual backing part so that it's able to still move around. So you're going to put glue, oh no, sorry. This one wraps around your actual paper clip. Yeah, it wraps around your paper clip, so just so you can see what that looks like. Yeah, that one you put around your paper clip like this. So that way it has a pointer. And did you guys see what that one looks like? Yep, exactly. Okay, so there's two different ones. Um, hold on, let me see. Oh, wait, what is that one? Oh, wait, hold on. Help. 
Clean. So she has help. very thin. Okay. And that's not the. I don't. Oh. Oh wait. Did you put this there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's and then. Okay. Those are the two. No, not for this one. Okay. Um, has everyone finished that one? Yeah. We have a lot of goodies, sorry. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the next one. So we can just keep it like that? Or, or yeah, you can decide. Or use it uh, separate. Right? Correct. Right. Thank you. So this is just a point, right? and yeah, which, mm -hmm. which is the best way to cope the, the Right. Whatever behavior, they choose right, the yeah. would be the most calming yeah. for them. Okay. <laughs> You guys can just put your trash in the middle of the table and then we'll come around and collect. Okay. All right. So, are we good to move on to the next one? Yes. Okay. Great. So, this one is a um, key ring. And you'll see this on a lot of teachers' badges because it's like a quick, like, hey, <laughs> I need you to do this. Um, so this is just a visual to reinforce what direction you've been giving, you're giving the student. So like we have clean up, go, work, and you'll see the ones that you're given as both English and Spanish. Um, so what we're gonna do for this one is very simple. We're just going to cut them out and then you'll see a ring in your bag. And once you've cut them out, let me know and we'll come around with some, we only have, sorry, we only have two hole punchers, unfortunately. Uh, it's there, but that one might be tricky. Yeah. Yes. Did you see this little thing? We cut it? Yes. Too? So, uh, so, no, don't cut it. So, that was a great question. She was asking about the tabs. So, the tabs there, you don't want to cut off. You want to keep it because that helps you locate which one you're looking for. So, do not cut those tabs. Thank you. Sorry, I know this is a lot of cutting. But once it's made, it is seriously one of the best resources that you'll have um, to support instruction. Thank you so much for doing Oh, good. So then now is the perfect time. I'm glad. That makes me happy to hear. I mean, I remember when I used to go to these trainings to this was my favorite part of it, was being able to take materials to be able to then implement yes. 
and the setting. So I'm glad you guys enjoy it. Um, she asked, is there a reason why the wheel wasn't laminated? Um, it was resources. Okay. <laughs> yes, saying. but ideally, if we could laminate everything, mm -hmm. I would laminate everything just to be able to have for durability. Yes. Um, we also do have contact paper here. So I didn't cut them out for you guys, but you're welcome to take contact paper too to cover anything that is not laminated that we've given you. Um, another thing that you'll find that is not anything that's going to require you to do anything, but these are like placemats that we've put in um, sheet protectors and just taping the sheet protector at the end is another good strategy of um, alternatives to laminating. What's that? Yeah, you can do yeah. both. Or can I do one page and then do the Yes, one? absolutely. You know what? You <laughs> yes, you can. So Just as long as you steps. know, yeah. you know how to. Yes, yeah. exactly. So when we pass around the hole puncher, you can really hole punch a group at a time. Um, so you could take half of them, put the hole puncher through, and then the second half, put the hole puncher through. Um, what I usually do is I use one of them from the previous one and then line it up with the rest of them so that way I'm punching at the same place. So I'm gonna pass the hole puncher around. Don't be scared. <laughs> So oh, you, you do, you yeah. should do. Uh, ah, everything together? Oh. And then make sure you just have enough space. Yep. Uh. Okay. Use the muscle. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> and what is that? Okay. okay. It's okay. Here I go. There you oh, go. Wow. Okay. Pretty and then, okay. so what and I do is I line that one up ah, ah, and then good. put the hole yeah, where one. the same one is. Oh, exactly. Oh. Did you see that? Oh, you did not see it. Did not see it? <laughs> there you go. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm done with that part, but um, how do you open that? I know some of them are. <laughs> so if you have trouble with your key ring, you kind of have to separate them a little bit and then pull. I know these ones are There's actually <laughs> close it and leave it closed forever. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else ready for the hole puncher? Okay, here? Sure. You were asking me about more of these, right? Yeah, I Show whatever colors you I'll want. Another blue one. Okay. Actually, I'll do yellow. Okay, you can take wait. Wait. No, that's one. Okay. 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 okay, thanks. Okay, so this stuff, I'm just going to put the stuff we've done down here. Okay. This is the last one, I believe. We can just skip that entire space. Yeah. And this is Yeah. Um, I'm wondering. Or the order that you put them in? Um, it does, there isn't a strategy, but it is lined up so that way okay. it's sequential to 
um, the front tab and then down. Okay. Oh, there is not a specific order to which you line it up. Um, there's no strategy. You can use it however you would like, but there, the way that the tabs are lined up, one's facing, one's facing the top and then one's on the bottom and you can just go in order. Uh, is anyone else ready for the hole puncher? Yes. One. Although, <laughs> how do we keep the, this? Is, this would be helpful if one could. Is there a way that? You know, there's pros and cons. I've, I've heard. Is there enough? Absolutely, there's enough. You can have a seat here. Yeah, and then I'll um, pass around what. So they're working on this one right now. And let me just grab you a pair of scissors. So you just need one of these baggies and then they're cutting them out and then mm -hmm. using the hole puncher to clip or to oh, poke okay. a so hole here. Got it. Yeah, the key ring. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. After that you don't have to buy it yet. How much is oh. I'm not sure off the Is it still like three ninety five? I don't I don't know. I'm wondering, I mean, since we're already making everything, because we haven't, we haven't gone over this yet, this is for you, okay, but I'm wondering if we should just make it now. You what? I'm mm wondering -hmm. if we should just make it now. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah. Okay. okay. Is your daughter in the uh, Malia has them. How are we doing on the key rings? Are we almost done? Yes. Hole puncher. Where did it go? Do you know where the hole punchers are? Oh. Do the greens and blues go together or does it matter? It, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, like they could be used at any. Are there category? And, like, are they no, no, it's not categorized at all. I know. If you get it in a particular order, I might as well repeat it. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay? Finish it at home. Yeah. Was there any other hole puncher? We had two. One here, one okay. okay. You know the regular punchers, the ones that we use for, for, for yeah. Any, uh, those can cut this one yeah. one too, right? Sure. You know it's just um, you just have to make sure that the line, so it's hard ah, to see where you true. put it, with the, with the one right? That, mm. But you can still use it. It's just, no, you I have to just pay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I know that it okay. is old. That's the name, all right? Whole well done. Whole puncher, right? Oh, okay. We decided that. 
you have these kids for a long time, you might as well invest on a laminator. <laughs> this is this is very true. Decades ago, you use contact paper, it doesn't stay. It's never laid, right? Well you know, it's hard to get into this. It's more than, yeah. I don't know how big out. That's that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No problem. And then after you guys are done, we're just going to do one more. And the rest you'll be able to just take with you um, and use. The only thing that I'll give you instructions for is the token board. But that can be done at home. I don't think we have a larger one. What? I don't think we have a larger one. There is one in the back corner over there. Oh. Oh, there is. Put it somewhere. Sure. Okay, we're going to start passing out the materials for our next one. Um, and this is um, food choices that they can be put on the refrigerator. So we'll use magnetic strips um, to be able to put on the back of these for uh, parents to be able to put on the refrigerator uh, for children to make their food choices. And again, like taking pictures of real items, you ideally want to use your kids' most preferred and favorite foods so that way they can just go and point to it and you can again give them the words to use to be able to ask for it. Um, what we're going to be using, so this is another alternative to laminating. This is a card sheet protector. So when you cut this one, you have to make sure to cut in the middle of this to make sure that it doesn't open up. But it's, it's not that hard. It's okay. You just have to be a little bit more vigilant um, when you cut in between the lines here. And then you'll cut this part off, the part where it has the rings here. That part you'll cut off. But everything else you're just going to cut in between the perforated lines that are there. And then you'll cut your pictures and slide them in afterwards. So. Um, actually, I think we have enough for two. I wasn't sure, so yeah. I didn't I'll go back around. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> I'd cut the edge off first. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Am I cutting right down on the dot? Or no, no. Well, not for that part. So okay. the end of it, you just want to make sure that perforated line is still there because that's actually what's holding it intact. So just right outside of that is where you're going to cut off the three rings. And then... For all of the other squares in between, that's when you're going to cut in between the perforated line to make sure that it's on both sides. What? Yes. Um, what these are called exactly at the store. What if you go look at them? Um, often used for children who collect cards. cards. Oh, okay. You can get them in the same section as the sheet protectors, but they're so just make sure you're looking for the right size <laughs> um sorry can I have you guys 
look up here just for a second, just to make sure everyone cuts this right because it is tricky. Okay, so if I have it um, landscape mode, these two perforations here, you can see this is the opening. You want to cut outside of that perforation. So I would do those two first as you go. Do you see like I didn't cut that perforated line? That one and then the next one. So do those two first. If you need another one, we have extras if you already started and didn't do that. <laughs> I can, I'm glad to help you if you need help. <laughs> you can take my samples. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So then once you've done that one, that's when you've you take each one and cut in between. And I know like laminating is so much easier, but again, we want to be able to provide resources that parents can be able to use at home. Exactly. Because laminators can get expensive in the materials that they use. So this is just another option. How are we doing? I'm getting it. So well, if you need if you need right. some, I, you can use the ones that I've made. <laughs> it's hard to see, right? This is the same like this line. Yes. Cut on the line, right? On this thing. We don't cut on the line. We cut outside, outside the line. line. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Did you guys find that? Yeah. Yes. So that one you're cutting. You just want to make sure where the opening is and cut outside that one. Yeah. Yeah. In between. In the middle. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because we want to be able yeah, to keep it together I still. No, no, no. You cut in, in the, in the la on the line here? In the middle? Mm-hmm. On the line. On the line in between. Ooh. Oh, shoot. <laughs> like, on the line. Look at that one. <laughs> Let's test your fine motor skills. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just remember thinking my daughter should be <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I so our objective is to be like this, right? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. And then you should be able to slide in your picture symbols once you've made them and cut them out. And then the last part would just be taping the ends to secure it. In your bags, you'll see um, there's nine um, magnetic strips that you'll put on the back side of the picture on the outside plastic part. Yes. Yeah. So what we're so now you cut in between. You see? Half a hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, these ones are also done, so you can, you're welcome to those. Yep. 
And then again, your last step is just getting the magnetic strips and then putting on the outside backing plastic part. And I'll also give you the pinwheel and color would you like for the foldable? Ooh, can I have blue? <laughs> sure. <piece>? Thank you. <laughs> so once you guys are done with that, that's the end of the make and take. So congratulations on cutting and putting it all together. Uh, the rest of the stuff you'll be able to collect at the end of everything. Um, to take with you. Okay? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Just let me know which ones do you need these? No, I already put my okay. papers on. Yes, yeah, perfect. And I, I just grabbed the. Yeah, Thank we've you. got plenty. <laughs> Very picky. Very limited amount of food. Yeah. What are his favorite or her favorite? Uh, he eats snacks during the day. We try to have him eat. I try to make soups for him, but I have to mash it with rice. Right. Just, you know, we figure out day by day what he eats. <laughs> <laughs> Is he going to take it? Yeah. Let's go and take this one. Yes. Any kind of tape, right? Yes, right. and we can. We have some tape. But if, but, if you're going to want to change it, yeah. You don't want to. But you can finish this. Yeah. You know this whole thing. Mm -hmm. This part. It can tape it, but then cut it. Maybe. You know, to finish. I. Yeah. Any regular tape. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I just use scotch tape, and I did like this. Yeah, I want to see how you do because normally my the edges are my problem. Okay, and then I just cut the oh, No, you don't extra. need to, yeah. Okay, great. All right. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. And then iron it and then the heat will make it stick. Well, I will possibly melt everything so. <laughs> Yes. What do you need? The whole puncher. The whole puncher. Yeah. Sure. No, I have friends that are like they were like crafty, so if you don't I'm not sure everyone will identify with that. <laughs> and are these extras for you guys or did you We already did that. Okay. Just wanna make sure I'm not taking any of the stuff you need. And do you need these? I have mine. Okay, and you've got yours. Do you have, do you need another one? Need another okay. one. okay. 
How are you guys doing over here? You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much for this. You're welcome. And sure. And these ones are these. Do you need these ones? This, this one is, is the one I was working on. And you have yours? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I, yes, and I know you. Yeah, it's um, the green part. Yes, yes. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. That's perfect. Thank you. Well, I'm glad they found it helpful. Yeah. Does anyone want contact paper? <laughs> Okay, we'll put um, all our extra supplies um, in a corner where you guys can grab whatever you need for the rest of your stuff. Thanks. Okay. And are you guys using these ones? All right, we're going to wrap up the make and take because we also have two other parts we want to get to and make sure that you guys get everything that you came here for today, okay? I need to clip it. Yeah. Th these are. Move along. 
along now in our presentation and talk about meal times. <laughs> So um, what you see up here, this one right here, is what you guys have been working on making with the magnetic strips. So um, it's a snack choice board, but that would be um, something you could put up on a wall in your house or on the refrigerator. Um, so with making choices, that really helps to children um, to keep expectations clear. Um, you can also use visuals to work on joint attention during, um, during mealtime. Meals are a very social time, so working on practicing social exchanges is really important during that time. So these are just you know, some visual supports that you could use to, um, for a child to help make food choices. They can be objects. For some children at the beginning, um, it's hard to understand a 2D representation of, it's hard to understand sometimes that a picture of a cookie is the same as a cookie. So for, sometimes you might want to actually use the actual thing. So you might use, if you're talking about an Oreo, maybe a single pack Oreo, and you know, say, do you want Oreo, or do you want, to use the celery example, celery. So you're using the actual things. Um, and then as children grow in their understanding and their literacy skills, you can go to using the 2D representations. Um, so they could be actual photos, and then the most sort of difficult to understand is is like a line drawing, like a picture symbol that represents uh, like a photograph or a real thing. So over here you can see this mom has her um, picture. She has real life pictures of probably her child's favorite um, food choices and they're magnetic um, on the refrigerator. And so she's able to have a conversation, a back and forth exchange about what do you want. Um, the important, one of the important things to remember about making choices is it really helps facilitate self-determination. Children um, will really feel like they have a say in what is happening in their world, and that's really important. Um, it helps children to feel more in control, and overall helps to increase autonomy. Um, so in this example where this mom is talking um, to her son about what he might want to eat, it's really important to acknowledge and give a response to um, what he's trying to communicate. So if he reaches for the, let's say, the cereal, I can't see all of them, the cereal right there, um, that you say, oh, cereal, you're telling me you want cereal. And maybe he throws it to the ground. Oh, you don't want cereal. So maybe he grabs the goldfish or he points or even looks at the goldfish. Oh, goldfish, you're telling me that you want goldfish. Um, so, uh, Using um, strategies su as, such as something called aided language input, which is the practice of modeling AAC when speaking to people who are trying to learn AAC, is really a pivotal um, intervention strategy, and it's evidence-based, um, and it's been shown to support both communication and, express and um, comprehension. So then the second one is sort of what, what you guys made, and this, um, for some children, just making the choice between either two objects or two pictures of objects. So you would just have a board that says, I want, and then Velcro on, on two sides so that they could choose, and then you'd have the picture symbol, so they can choose between two things. So those are both important skills, both choosing from a wide field of items and then choosing between two items. Here's another example of ways that visuals can be used um, during mealtime. So these are placemats, and we are going to have something similar that you can take home with you. Um, but in this situation, for this child, Yusuf, he has a placemat that says, I want, open, more, all done, I like, I don't like, which is a super important thing for kids to be able to communicate, um, thirsty, and hungry. So. Um, when, you know, having a meal, you, the child can have this in front of them, and you, it's not only for them to point to things and tell you what they want, it's for you to also say, do you like that? You know, so maybe you're pointing to it and saying, do you like that? Or maybe they pick up their water bottle and they start fidgeting with the top. So you say, open. You know, you're trying to tell me you want it open. 
So you're also communicating with your child about things that they're, and you really are respecting those attempts at communication. This is another example of a um, placemat that could be used at snack time. Uh, this one says, I want, so it's, it's I want, it's a picture of the sign, um, please, which can sometimes be an important skill to learn, yes and no, which are super important, and then I'm finished. Sometimes children communicate things like I'm finished through throwing the goldfish on the ground, or getting out of the chair, or, you know, turning around in the chair. But, you know, showing them that there's a way to communicate that, oh, you're telling me you're finished, you're finished. And maybe if you model that for the child, the child might touch the picture, and then they've really learned um, a, a step in communication. So these placemats, so again, you're gonna get one that's similar. You can put a picture of your child in the middle, and then some important kind of keywords. You could also make one of these yourself with if you wanted different words. So then we also have, um, some AAC or speech generating devices. So this um, is a twin talk, like you see, very similar to what you see in the picture. And for this one, it's been programmed go. to say go stop. and stop. And those are words um, that are core words that can be used across a variety of settings. So a child could say go, go. to say they want to go outside. A child could say go to maybe they want to play chase, but you can use words like go for a lot of situations. And stop, maybe they threw the goldfish to the ground. Stop. You know, stop, you're stop. telling me stop. You told me you want to stop eating, you're all done with snack. Um, so sometimes we see these devices um, in the classroom. Sometimes children have them at home too, but we just wanted to show you uh, what a speech generating device might, might look like. And they can be programmed to say any number of things. So these are just pictures that are stuck on here. And they can be um, programmed to say anything. Um, we also have some other sort of low-tech devices. This is called a Tech Talk. Um, some children use these. So this has got I want more. So then you've got a sentence there. So these again, these symbols can be interchanged and the buttons can be programmed to say any number of things. So again, we have what are called core words on this particular device. In addition to I, want, and more, we have stop, which is very important, eat, drink, go, and play. So those are some words you can really use to communicate with your child across a wide variety of settings. Um, so we wanted to show you that. We also have, sorry, I did have a question. Yes, of course. Uh, I see that the program, I think, has a uh -huh. voice, right? Yes. But when I show it to a kid, uh, should I push it, or I should just want it and use my voice? Yeah, that's because a really I know good that question. they will do it. That's a really good question. They don't communicate easily, right? They don't want to So talk. I think what I hear you saying is, should you model? Mm -hmm. um, and Instead of pushing the sound again, so is it better to just point it and talk? That's a great question. So she's asking, is it better to just point to the pictures and talk about them mm -hmm. or to actually push the button? Mm -hmm. And actually, it's important to model exactly what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. So if they're having a snack, you would want to say, do you want to eat? Look, we have some crackers to eat. You're modeling and you're pushing the button. So you're using the device just like you would um, show a child how to speak using their spoken voice, you're gonna show them what we want them to do to communicate with a device. So yeah, you're gonna push the button and say, eat. Maybe they grab a goldfish, oh, look, you're eating, you're eating a goldfish. And I am pushing it a lot, but every time I do that, I'm modeling, and so they're, they're knowing, the idea is that they're gonna then eventually touch the button and say, eat. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Thanks. Okay. Um, the third thank you, mm -hmm. um, device that we're going to talk about is an iPad. Um, in this case, this is a um, really a communication device.
So if a child, um, this is using a program called LAMP, Words for Life. You can see the pictures on it are quite small, but there are children who use um, this um, program with, on an iPad, either in the home um, or at, at school. Um, it can be, it's got many, many, many words on it, so much, many, many more words than something like this. Um, but there are children, for some children for whom this is appropriate. Um, when a child is using this, they're probably using it as a, a designated communication device, so they don't also watch YouTube videos of Paw Patrol on it. They understand that this iPad is, is their talker, and they're using it just for that purpose. going forward. Um, another way that you can use visuals is during a uh, cooking activity. Young children often love to cook. It's a very fun um, project that you can do together. It really works on building social skills, following directions, and in this case also um, literacy. So um, again, so this, these um, cooking activities have been broken down into what we would call a task analysis. Um, so we have an example here of how to make pancakes, how to make applesauce, and how to make pepperoni pizza. Um, again, these can help with predictability. Um, for a child understanding what the activity is and what the expectations are, uh, they also work on pre-literacy skills. So students are able to read the instructions, even if they can't read the words. They can read the pictures, and that's an early literacy skill. Again, working on joint attention with young children is sometimes very important. That's sometimes a skill that children need, need help on. So looking at the pictures together and talking about what's in the pictures. Let's see. So with the pepperoni pizza, look at this, we have pizza. And maybe they touch the pizza. Yeah, that's pizza, you showed me pizza. So go, doing that back and forth and working on joint attention is very, very important. Um, Children feel really powerful as they're able to understand the steps and really be an active part of what they may view as a grown-up task. So cooking is, is a great activity to do with young children. And again, you can use pictures. We use board maker pictures, but you can definitely use pictures. There is a wealth of pictures on um, just Google um, images. Also, like Jenny said before, using pictures of your child actually doing the steps is gonna be very, very powerful. They're going to see themselves in this situation. You know, maybe they're, they're pouring something out of a cup. So you're gonna take a picture and you can use that. To, maybe you do one activity and you take pictures um, during the activity and then you can print them out and use them for later activities. There we go, that is meals. All right, so we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna get into the fun stuff. We're gonna talk about play. So, let's see. So, tying into the visual supports, you can also use visual supports and choice boards when you're using toys. So, up here on our slide, we have an example of a, of a play choice board. It has the words more or again, um, block, knock it down. That would be a favorite in my house. So fun to knock things down. Like. Um, stop or finished, you have tower, you have look, and you have uh-oh, so modeling that social language and that making comments in the game that you're playing. Um, we also have a kit shown here where they've put all of the baby doll items together, so your doll, your doll bottle, the bib, um, and again they have a choice board of words created that they would use when playing with the baby doll. And they keep it all together in a box. So you can take out that one box and focus on playing with that one activity at a time. And that kind of helps things stay organized and not so overwhelming when you're going through your toys at home. Um, and then lastly, this picture is a, of a boy playing with Mr. Potato Head. And he has what's called a PEX communication book. It's a picture exchange communication book. So just like those pictures we used for our choices with the refrigerator, those little tiny cards, um, you could take pictures of all sorts of 
toys. You could take pictures of the body parts of Mr. Potato Head and have them in the book. And then the, the child would be pulling the picture out of the book and handing it to you as a way to symbolize what he wants. So maybe he wants to put on the eyes next. So he's grabbed the picture of the eyes and he's giving it to whoever he's playing with to say and communicate, I want the eyes next. Um, that's a kind of a beginning skill. Not, not every student needs that much support in the playtime, um, but it is an option. So we have some samples up here as well um, of other ways. So Sarah talked about using those core words. So there's a board up here that has those core words on them. Um, so I, you, go, stop, turn, fast, slow. So a bunch of words that you can use in multiple situations. So you could use this um, when playing with Play-Doh and say, like, I put on, when you're talking about your cookie cutter, I put on the cookie cutter. Or your child could use this and say, you put on, so you do it. Um, so kind of modeling that communication aspect of play, um, this is a good tool to use. And similar to the placemat, there's one that's more specific to actually playing with the um, Play-Doh and the cookie cutters. So you have your I, you, more, help, cut, squish, push, roll, your colors, and then your tools, your rolling pin, and your cookie cutters. So something else that you could have available. Um, and you can play Play-Doh right on top of this because it's protected by your sheet protector. So just a few ideas of how you could incorporate those tools and the communication visuals into play. So the next thing I'm going to show you is about switch access. So this is for your children who can't access a toy the way um, you would normally access it. So somebody who might have a physical disability who couldn't push the button on a, an animated stuffed animal might need some more support. So what you see up here is called a battery interrupter right here. And it's just got a little metal disc on the top that you can stick into a regular battery operated toy and you can plug a switch into the end. So I have some over here I'm going to show you. So when I say switch, I'm talking about this button right here. So this is a switch and I have a battery interrupter in my penguin up here. So just where her battery component is, I've stuck it in in between the batteries. Um, and I've plugged in my switch. And so now I can activate her by pushing the button. She's my favorite. She's so fun. <laughs> One thing to be aware of is if the toy has a button that needs to be pushed normally, you have to have that compressed for the switch and battery interrupter to work. So you want to make sure you have something like a clothespin or a binder clip that you're going to put on that button to hold it down so that your switch will activate. So here's another example. I've got my chihuahua. He's very fun too. He dances for you. <laughs> and here's one more. This is actually a train that will move. So just an idea of how you could use it with any sort of battery operated toy. So that's a fun tool to use with your students or children who don't have the physical ability to activate a toy the way it's meant to be played with. It gives them a little more independence in that skill. So the question was, where can you get a battery interrupter? And yes, Amazon does have them. I think they run around $10. They come in different sizes, so you'll want to be aware of what size batteries your toy has. Um, so they'll come in a smaller size for your AA batteries and AAA batteries, and then they have a bigger disc on the end when you're using C and D batteries. So just make sure when you're researching, you're looking for the right size. Sure. So the question is, is there a wireless version of the switch? Um, there are wireless switches available, but they'll come in two pieces because you'll have to have the receiver and then the Bluetooth switch as well. So you would have to have a place on your toy to attach the receiver in order for it to move around. Yeah. There's, those are a little bit more expensive because you're getting the two pieces, um, but it is, it is available out there. 
Um, also on this slide, you'll see that they've shown a bubble machine. So that's a fun one to adapt as well. Yep. Um, some other fun ways to adapt toys. I don't know if you're familiar with the Go Fish game where the fish spin and you use, your, you use your pole. You can adapt that so that someone has to hold down the button for the fish to spin. So then you're including your friends who have those physical disabilities who might not be able to use the actual fishing pole, but they can be in charge of making the fish go around. So there's no limit to how you can use your battery interrupters. So you just have to get creative with that. All right, so now we're going to get into some screen time. <laughs> this is a high debate topic, right? Um, so these are some important things to remember when you're using the iPad um, YouTube Kids or any app that your educational app that you're planning to use. Um, so you want to prioritize that interactive experience. When you're using screens, you, a good thing to do is to co-view with your child to help them understand what they're viewing and also to monitor <laughs> what they're viewing so you're aware of what they're seeing. Um, and place consistent time limits on using the iPad. Um, you can designate media-free times in your day and just remove that iPad or computer and not have it available. So the American Academy of Pediatric recommendation is to avoid screen time with any child who is younger than 18 months, with the exception of FaceTime, so you can still talk to grandma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is what their, um, their recommendation is. So think about that as well when you're exposing your children to the iPads. So what we're going to get into next is kind of exploring with iPads. And we have some hands on, but I'm going to switch gears and hook up my iPad so you can see what I'm doing. Um, but one cool thing to think about is YouTube Kids allows you to set a time limit for your kids, and then it will shut down. So it's not you telling your children <laughs> it's time for the iPad to go away. The iPad told them. So that kind of can eliminate some behavioral struggles that many of our children might have when removing the iPad. I know my son has a hard time letting go of his YouTube videos. Um, so I'm just going to plug in mine. And if you want to pass out those iPads and the stack in front of you, Jenny, is also, those are set up. And we'll do a little exploring. <coughs> Sure. So she was just saying she's never used the timer on the iPad, um, but she was suggesting a great thing to do would be to make sure you let your child know that it is going to come to an end at a certain time so they don't just freak out and have a tantrum at the end. Okay, so when you have your iPad, let's see if mine will come up. There it is. So when you have your iPad, I've set them up so I didn't program yours, but you can, I'm sure. That's fine. So at the bottom of your, someone's already in there in YouTube Kids. <laughs> oh, maybe it's not turned on. So on the top, hold down the button on the top and you'll see the Apple, once the Apple pops up, you should be good. Do you need help with yours? If you guys want to watch me and then I'll give you a moment to practice after that way if we have all the videos going we won't get all that feedback. So it will turn on in just a second. Okay so when you see your iPad come on on the bottom you should have YouTube Kids, an app called Starfall, and settings. So those are the only things we're going to mess with today. Um, so I'll show you the YouTube Kids. So when you click on YouTube Kids and you open it up plays this fun intro. So a nice thing about YouTube Kids that regular YouTube doesn't have is it will ask you, are you a kid or a parent? And then it will limit your access to what you can see. So you have to put in, don't look how old I am. <laughs> 
you have to put in some things. I'm going to skip through this stuff, but you can learn the tutorial. Let me in. All right. We just put this app on all these iPads for training, so some of them haven't been opened yet. So once you're in, you can see you have your videos that you can choose from. And in the bottom left, did everyone see that? I'm sorry, bottom right, there's a little lock button. So when you click on that lock button, it's going to open up some parent-only access. And just to let you know, we do have handouts for how to Yes, so you don't have to remember this. We will give you, uh, yeah. we will give you a handout. <laughs> oh my goodness, pregnancy brain, 8 times 8, 64. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is challenging. No pressure. Okay, so down here. It's going to pop up after you do their math problem. <laughs> Some options. So you can click on timer, the top option, and set a time limit. For the purpose of this, I'm going to take it down to one minute because I don't want to be watching forever. And you'll just hit start timer. So now I have one minute to play. So if I start my Barbie video, we can watch and see what happens at the one minute mark. You can enjoy your video. A minute is really long when you're just waiting for something to happen, right? <laughs> so YouTube Kids has settings available where you can set it for younger children or older children um, in the settings. In that same area with the lock, there was a settings category, and you could set it to toddler videos or um, older children videos. I will say it's still YouTube. So you have to know that the content that's available might not be um, what you want your student to, or child to be watching. So then when your time's up, this happens. Yay, time's up. Go do something else fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then you can access your, your adult panel again on the bottom right. All right. So we're going to get out of that one. And I'm going to show you, I think the next one was to do guided access on the iPad. Have you heard of guided access? No? OK. So guided access is actually a part. It's built into the iPad. So for that, you would go to the settings function. You can follow along with me on this one if you want. It won't be noisy. <laughs> so once you're in the settings, then you're going to go to general. And you're going to want to click on accessibility. So once you're in accessibility, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you should see what's called guided access. And you're going to click on guided access, and you want to toggle that button so that it turns on. Everybody with me? Yeah? No? <laughs> if anyone needs help, just put your hand up and we'll have someone come help you. So once you have that on, you're going to type in passcode settings and you're going to set a guided access passcode. So for today, if you could please use just a series of ones, otherwise we'll be locked out of our iPads. <laughs> but you can set this to whatever you will remember. Um, so I'm just going to type in one, 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 one. And you'll have to do it twice. And now guided access is set on my iPad. Is everyone with me? OK. So then we're going to go back out to our home screen. And we're going to click on the little app on the bottom with the star right here. That's fine. Starfall ABCs is fine, too. Oh, anything is fine if you don't have Starfall, if you have an iPad that wasn't. Okay, so once you're in your app, you can keep a child in an app. So like right now, when I hit the home screen, it goes back out. 
when I hit this button to clear it. But if I want my child to stay within Starfall so that I can go use the bathroom or cook dinner or whatever it is I need to do and not have to worry about them getting out, you just triple click. So you're going to really quick hit the home button three times. And then you'll get this screen. Okay, so once you're on this screen, we have some choices here. So you can go ahead and on the top right, you could just hit start and it would start and it will lock you into that app. So let's try that if we hit start. And it will tell you guided access is started. So now when I click on my home screen at the top, it's going to tell me guided access is enabled. You can't get out. So unless you have a super observant little, little one who's watching you do the triple click and put in the password, this should keep them in this app. So to get out, you do the same, triple click. And then you'll put in your password. That's super secret, 1111. And it will bring you back to this menu screen. Sure, so you triple clicked. And then it asks for your password. And you put in your password. And then, see, now we're back to our menu screen. So you have some choices here. If you hit end, it will take you back out to your home screen on your iPad. And you'll just be done with guided access. And you won't have to worry about it being on. If you hit resume, it will go back into the app that you're already in. And it will be locked on that app. If you don't push end, then it always will be there. Right. If you don't turn this off, you, your, ba your battery will die, essentially, and then it will come back. <laughs> um, but I do want to show you this on the bottom. There's something within guided access that works just like the YouTube Kids time limit. So down on your bottom right, you can click on time limit options. And you want to toggle that on so it's green. And then you can set a time limit in here as well. And when you hit resume, then you have a one minute time limit to play your games. So I can play. I'm not connected to the internet, so it won't let me. So after this one minute time limit, it will still remain locked in guided access on this app. So it's just going to block out this app. There is a setting on the regular iPad where you can block access to a, a group of apps. So like if you're wanting to put a time limit on entertainment apps for the day, you can block access to that and it will lock down every entertainment app on the iPad. Um, so that's an option in the newer update, but it's not something I was going to get into. If you want to talk about it, we can talk about it after. I'd be happy to show you. Um, so Starfall is not working because I'm not connected to the internet, but when that minute I have five seconds left. When that minute's up, it will lock, and it will just say your time has expired. So then you would have to do the triple click and put in your password to get started again or to get out. Does anyone have questions about that? OK. And this guided access will work with any app. So any application you have on your iPad, it will work. Yes? Is the guided access available in general on any iPad, or is this a particular okay. Yes. So the question was, is guided access available on any iPad? So yes, it is available on your iPad, on your iPhone. Um, so on any of your Apple tools, you should have that access. Is yes? there any Android equivalent? Oh, I was hoping no one would ask me that. <laughs> The question was, is there any Android equivalent? I don't personally own an Android, and I'm hearing from the back that no, there is not. So, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to switch back over here. Oh, I'm going to need you, Jenny. Sorry. So we're just going to do a few more things that are computer-based and less app-based. The question was, is the timer on guided access new? And I'm not certain when they started doing that. But it is a very handy tool to have. Yes? Is there a way, um, I have a little bit of an older child, but I'm comfortable with them before, mm -hmm. like free navigation. So is there a way where it's just the whole iPad shuts down, not just individual apps? 
Okay, so the question was, is there a way to lock the whole iPad to shut down? And yes, there is a way to turn on um, time limits for specific app types. So in the newer version of iOS, it is under the screen time in, yeah. Your, yeah. in your settings. And you'll be able to go in under screen time and set um, timers for specific chunks of apps. So it won't be apps app specific, but it would be like all your entertainment apps will all stop working. Apps, yeah. Right. Okay. So But let's say navigation still will be available, right? But navigation for the iPad would still be available. So if he yes. has it or she has it, she would Ooh. Yes. So then your time limit would go off at the same time. And it's a daily time limit. So if he was using the iPad for 20 minutes, but his time limit for the day is 30, he could come back at another time and finish the 10 minutes. Okay? All right, so here's YouTube Kids. We did that. We did the guided access. So this next thing I want to show you is taking us back to the realm of switches or um, accessing stories on the computer. So this is called Tar, he Tar Heel Gameplay, and it's a website that will let you take any YouTube video and turn it into a cause and effect activity. So this would be for your lower, your lower learners. Um, and you can use the mouse, you can use a touch screen, you can use a switch like I showed you with our toys up here. Um, and you can customize the amount of time the video plays for before it's prompting you to push the button to keep going. How did you get the Swiss It's called tarheelgameplay.org. I'm going to show you. So this is what it would look like if you're creating your own. So you're going to add your YouTube, whatever YouTube video you want your student to see, you would put in here. And then you would put in pause every five seconds and then push button. So when you have your activity on, it will look like this. So it's going to prompt you to push the button. You push the button and it will play the video. Button. And then it's going to prompt you to push the button again. So if you're working on that cause and effect skill, which can be really difficult for some of our little people um, to understand, they want everything and they want it right now <laughs> and immediately, um, this is a cool way to incorporate some technology into that. All right. So we have a couple other online resources that are listed in your PowerPoint. There's a whole list of websites and Tar Heel should be one of them. It's the last, second to last slide, I believe. So you have access to all of those. Um, but there are tons of great free educational websites that work on early childhood um, foundational and pre-academic skills. Um, so these are just some screenshots from some of those websites that you'll, you have listed. Um, so storyplace.org is a great one, abc.com is fun, and that one actually goes up into the older years as well, so you have it separated by grade level, starting with early childhood pre-K, and then there's a section for first grade and second grade, so it kind of grows with them. Um, shepherdsoftware.com has a preschool section, up to 10.com playfisherprice.com, starfall.com was the app we were using on the iPad. Um, as a demonstration. Owlibu.com is going to be more of a switch accessible cause and effect type website. So if you're working on that, um, you would hit, you know, hit your space bar and the next action would happen. Um, Scholastic has some great things. PBS Kids is awesome. And then Tar Heel is also on that list. ABC Mouse. Yes, so the question was can, about ABC Mouse. ABCMouse.com is a great website as well, but it's not a free resource. You would have yeah. to pay for your membership. Um, any other questions about websites? So the These are all free, yes. That you can recommend because there's so many. There's so, there are tons, yes. These are all ones that we recommend, yes. Um, one thing to be aware of is starfall.com, I believe, has certain parts that are free but then other content you, you do have to have a subscription for. So I think you can do all the alphabet letters, but you can't do all the colors and all the numbers without the subscription. Do you have any questions about this? No? <laughs> all right. You can have any adverts or any, it is like, um, sponsored by other companies that come into 
do they have ads on them? Um, yes, some of them do. I think ABC has some ads in it. Shepherd software. software will have ads in it. So yes, that is something to, to think about. Since these are like, yeah, visual, but in a device, right? So it's like an electronic device mm -hmm. using time. Should we count it in that time that sometimes is recommended or even? I would count it as part of your screen time. Whatever you decide, your screen time allotment is yeah. for the day. That's important for me mm -hmm. because, you know, yeah. a lot of screen time. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yes, you, you don't want to have too much screen time. I know that struggle with my own son as well. Okay. Do you have any questions about any of the other resources that we've previously talked about? <laughs> May have later. Yes. Yeah, I would ask, um, what would be your recommendations by age for amount of screen time? Oh, that's a hard one. So the question was, what is our recommendation by age for amount of screen time? Um, I think it's going to depend on who you ask. You can always ask your pediatrician, and I think they'll err towards less is better. Um, I've been told by my pediatrician that we want to stick with less than two hours for my four-year-old. Um, I think that's a lot of screen time, personally. So it's, it really is up to your own judgment. Um, I would observe behaviors as well. Um, I know when my son is watching too much TV or using the iPad for too long, then when we take it away, there's a significant change in his behavior and his listening skills and attitudes. So I would look at your own child and kind of come up with a de determination for how much. I think it's important to know also that a phone counts as screen time. Yes. So a phone counts just like an iPad does. Yes. That's a very, screen, that's a very good comment. Yeah. Any other questions? So this uh, the, target, the token boards, I'm sorry, how do you use the token boards again? Because it's, you just set up whatever it is that you want to give tokens for. Or, I mean, I, I understand the concept, but right. how would you use it? Okay, so the question was, how would you use a token board? Um, and so it really depends, again, on your child. Okay. So if I'm thinking about a child who's struggling with listening, mm -hmm. I would be providing a token every time that child is listening. So when they're following the direction the first time, if that's the expectation, I'm going to deliver that token and I'm going to praise them and say, wow, you really listened. That was great listening and give them a token. Um, and once they have that whole row filled up is when I might deliver something that's really exciting that they don't have access to all the time. Maybe it's screen time. Maybe it's a preferred toy that's kept out of the way and they can only play with it when they're being a really good listener. My son is highly motivated by dessert after dinner, so, <laughs> so ice cream cone after dinner or whatever it is. Um, so really think about your child and what their specific needs are. I would recommend that when you're using a tool, a behavior tool like a token board, stick with one behavior until you see a change in that behavior. Otherwise, your child is going to be like totally confused about what the expectations are. So you want to make sure that you're sticking with one thing that you're working on at a time. Does that make sense? What about the consistency if they're using a token board in the preschool classroom? So the question was, what about if they're using a behavior tool like a token board in the classroom at school and how to be consistent? I would definitely recommend talking to your teacher, your, your child's teacher, about that and making sure that whatever you are tackling at school is also being tackled at home. That will build consistency for your child and really it will help improve that behavior management at a faster pace if everyone in their life is doing the same. And the same applies for the visual tools and communication devices that we were talking about. You want to make sure if your child is using a communication device at school that you're able to get training on it and use that same device at home because otherwise you're teaching, if you think about it, it would be teaching two languages at once. So if at school the expectation is they're using the device, but at home the expectation is that they use their words or sign language, then they're, they're speaking two different languages. So you're essentially teaching them two things at once, which can be a little overwhelming for our friends who need extra support in communication. Any other questions? Just a question in terms of like FCPS, where are they going in um, with hand, because I know with handwriting skills, for example, it's not a big thing as it used to be, because a lot of, when they get to sort of middle school, even in uh, elementary school, um, they're using keyboards. Mm -hmm. How much of that is now an emphasis on even the younger ones? Because, like, are we to start them off using the keyboard mm -hmm. on these devices and instead of 
um, only just do the right hand or sure. anything that we should not be held back on? Sure. So the question was, in Fairfax County, um, what is the expectation for younger children using technology within the school buildings, whether it's the computer, um, keyboard, or an iPad? And I will say that the, the county is definitely moving towards using more technology. And when we have our, um, some of the assessments that they're doing are being done on the computer. So it definitely does benefit your child to know how to use a computer mouse or computer keyboard um, as they're the getting ready for school. I mean, they're working on a lot of the fine motor, being able to have proper hand use and everything. So those are skills that are definitely used in the preschool setting. That it's not, mm -hmm. they're not doing things on the computer other than to access like independent workstations where they're able to use a switch to access this or a touch screen to touch this but like they'll work on writing their name or writing certain parts of the alphabet so that's kind of part of the curriculum for um, the pre-k pos for and sometimes what we we do see sometimes is um, young children at preschool age sometimes have really good swiping skills and those sorts of things to use on an ipad but then developing those holding a crayon that some of that sometimes is delayed if there's not a lot of access. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely being worked on. Um, both. Yeah. So to, the simple answer is to work on both. <laughs> <laughs> you want to make sure you're using. I'm just wondering because like he recognizes on the iPad how to write his name, mm -hmm. but not necessarily with a pen or a paper pencil or a crayon. Um, and I don't know whether that's because he just finds that difficult to do or. Um, and should I be really stressing about it with him and trying to get him to write, or is it because it's okay for him to use the iPad because he's still communicating what his name is? And he's three and a half, right? And he's three and a half. Yeah. 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 So, but, but, I mean, with next thing you know, you'll be in kindergarten. Right. So the question <laughs> is, should you stress about a student or a child who prefers to use technology over um, fine motor? Um, and I think it's something you definitely want to make sure you're exposing your child to the opportunity to use fine motor. But we all have our preferences as well. Um, so I would, I would allow him to have opportunities to use the crayons or um, you can create similar picture cards with the letters and have him move them manually rather than touching on the iPad. Um, so things like that might be good activities. I like to incorporate letters into playtime. So making letters out of Play-Doh and rolling the Play-Doh and making the first letter of your name and then building on that. Um, there are tons of cookie cutters out there that are letters and fun things to do um, with toys that are letters as well. Yeah. Um, so just kind of thinking outside of the box of how you can tackle those same skills mm -hmm. with physical materials. Any other questions? All right, oops. Well, we still have more stuff to give you before you leave. So um, you'll get a token board, you'll get a placemat, um, two placemats actually, a first then um, template, and then there's one for washing hands and brushing teeth. And then also the guided access directions as well. Um, so one, one thing I wanted to tell you about the token boards, we'll hand out more Velcro with them as well because that wasn't in your bag. Um, but you'll want to put the rough Velcro on the base of, I'm sorry, the soft Velcro on the base of your board and the rough Velcro on the, on the pictures when you cut them out. So then you have them to physically move. You might also want to put a strip of soft Velcro on the back to hold your extra picture so you're not shuffling around trying to find them all over the house. Um, so just a little tip there. All right. And we'll be here if you have questions about any of this as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.